Good afternoon. Um, I'm Charlotte Moore, and I'm the Artistic Director of the Irish Repertory Theatre. We're joined today by three really brilliant, inventive, wonderfully talented designers. We're joined by James Morgan, James Noon, and Charlie Corcoran, who will, who will uh, talk to in turn. Uh, welcome, the three of you, welcome. So happy to see your beautiful faces. Now, tell me, James Morgan, what's the first show you ever designed for the Irish Rep? It was Pigtown. Was it? Yes, you came to a party at York, the York Theater. It was an opening night party and you pulled me aside and said, we've never worked together. I would really like to work with you. And uh, out of that, I did it. It was a little town in Ireland, obviously. We were mimicking what, where the people were in the town without having to show all the different buildings, trying to be creative as we tend to be at your theater, and uh, which is one of the joys of working there. I know what Charlie uh, has done recently. He's designed uh, the set for Piran uh, for Touch of the Poet. What's your most recent design, Jim Morgan? Well, my most recent design is one that hasn't, I mean, the design is done. It was ready to go into the shop for the York uh, show called Cheek to Cheek, Irving Berlin in Hollywood. And it's all songs by Irving Berlin from his Hollywood days, choreographed, conceived and directed by Randy Skinner. And uh, Jim Noon, what's your most recent set? I just did a new musical up in Canada called The Louder We Get. Mr. Corcoran, I yes. know where your set is. I've been in the rehearsal room in the middle of it. Tell us about it. It's a touch of the poet and it takes place in a colonial tavern in outside of, uh, or in Boston. So low ceilings, exposed beams, and sort of the main action takes place in the dining room, which is the gathering place. All three of you have done, have designed sets in the old theater before the renovation and in the new place after the renovation with some added space. How is that different? Does that give you any kind of a new freedom? It gives me a lot more freedom. Um, in the old configuration, we had audience seating on stage right. So you essentially had no wing space stage right. But now that seating that used to be there has moved into a balcony. Uh, on the second floor, so we have extra space. So I can store scenery, I can have pieces move on and off, I can build bigger sets. And the lighting grid was raised, I think, four feet or five feet from where it was, which is nice because um, lighting is now sort of out of the picture where it used to be sort of very present. And we have a brand new modular deck, which was um, built in Tom Carroll's studio, uh, made out of extruded aluminum with a brand new working turntable. Uh, the old space had a turntable <laughs> that was original to the space, which worked on a, um, a rubber tire, spun it, and you could <laughs> always guess where it would stop. Now we know where it's going to stop. Now, Jim Noon, you have done a couple of sets for me that have used both turntables. The possibilities, I think, have grown a bit, haven't they? Well, I think accuracy is the most important thing that's happened with the turntable. We sort of, uh, with the with the old turntable, if you got in about, you know, you, you could be anywhere from a foot to two feet off. <laughs> Donnie Brook, we used it a lot. We had four sets on that turntable and um, you sort of got close, but not as accurately as you can now, which for London Assurance, we needed to be pretty accurate. And so it was much more helpful the new one. Tell me about the problems of four separate sets in that theater space. Well, there's nowhere to go. Everything sort of has to be on stage in the playing area and sort of hidden within what you're doing. For Donnie Brook, it was a big unit that opened up in different positions and turned around and uh, got redressed. When I did Man and Superman, we pretended a lot. We had a, a neutral space. All the props became something like the bar cart became the car. So that was a little more creative. London Assurance was um, a little tricky because you can't go off stage right. Scenic units sort of have to remain on the stage. I did the first Juno. That was a little tricky because we did have audience seating, house left, stage right. We start 
with you, Jim Morgan. You've designed a both for the downstairs theater in a tiny space and upstairs. Tell me about the problems of and engin ingenuity of tiny spaces and small spaces. Well, one of the interesting things was uh, in terms of the upstairs space was doing the same show 10 years apart in the old and new version of that space, doing Finian's Rainbow twice for you and uh, how that changed the whole feel of it. And essentially, it was the same approach to the piece. But having doing it the second time, the stage right space being available for the orchestra for sort of storage of the cast, because we kept the cast on stage the whole time. And just the vista that was a, we could finally have the feeling of going off into the distance with Spanish moss and stuff on the trees was incredible. It really made a difference having that space to play with. Working downstairs, I've loved seeing how it's changed in the renovation. It's still funky, but it's much more manageable in the new version, I think. More height and you just don't feel as cramped. And as a designer, there's there's just that much more room to play with. I did uh, It's a Wonderful Life there, the radio play, in the old and new versions of the space. And it really changed, even though the set was exactly the same, we were able to do a lot more detail with it uh, in the new version of the space. And Charlie, you've worked in both venues. I've forgotten what you did downstairs. What was it that you did? Most recently, Lady G. Tell me how you thought about that. In a lot of different ways. First of all, Kieran went to the estate of Lady G and we FaceTimed and he showed me details of particularly the tree that her and her friends and her lovers used to carve their initials into. And so that became the focal point of our set and it told sort of the stories. You could look at the tree and see the initials of the people who she was speaking about on stage. So it sort of evolved out of that. I mean, you had four or five people to put on in that tiny space? Kira and I discussed um, how to have that many people on stage all the time and also have all the scenery and the props that they needed. So everything that was on stage had a purpose. So things that were the cots, for instance, in one of the scenes, spun around and became cots, but when they were towards us, they were sort of an architectural sculpture that you didn't understand what it was until it was used in a new and different way. How do you like to begin? How do you like to begin the process? I like to read the play once or twice and just go sit in the space that it's going to be in and think about it. Imagine where entrances and exits are gonna come from, how I can utilize in the Irish Rep a balcony, space or the stage right space, particularly in the Irish rep, what I'm going to turn that downstage right column into, how I'm going to hide it. Then I do a lot of research on the subject matter and then I start sketches and I present sketches usually to Kieran and we brainstorm from there. Now Jim Noon, <laughs> tell me about your process. Well usually you call me about a week before it's due. <laughs> <laughs> how dare you speak to me in that tone. <laughs> you know it, it really is you have to find the play in the space because it is such a unique space um, and has so many wonderful things yet complicated things to deal with. So really just looking at the space and finding where this place starts speaking to you. So, you know, you do your research, you have to, you know, the details are really what sells a uh, design in that space because it is so close to the audience. You can't really do fully realized places, you know, realistically, so you have to suggest a lot. So knowing the details helps. How do you all think about colors? How do you mesh the colors with the design? Tell me about how important colors are to establish a period. Well, you know, your theater is a particular color that's, which is green. That's a big key for a lot of what I go off of. You know, creating a design that works with your auditorium that feels like they blend together. Um, and then you do want to find colors that sort of are reminiscent of the period. You know, like the home place was all about the land that the family lived on, and it needed to be lush and beautiful and reflect what Ireland looks like. So the green of the auditorium sort of went into the green of the set, and there was a lot of green on that show. You know, Donnie Brook, the colors were a little cheerier. You know, I used a brighter version of 
the colors that one would usually see. Now, Jim Morgan, I know that color is very important to you. I mean, you're, you're quite an artist. Tell me how you use color. I think it comes out of the piece. It comes out of talking with you, how you respond to the piece and how you talk about it. Like when we did Aristocrats by Brian Friel, it's all about this magnificent fading mansion in the countryside. And this is on the old version of the upstairs theater stage. No way we could hope to put that kind of architecture on stage. So it ended up being a series. It was actually one photograph of a house similar to it, chopped up and created into prints. So it was a very abstracted view of this very period house, but it, it evoked it. The color of most of the prints were sort of sepia toned, which was appropriate for the house, but also sort of set it back in the past, but then a rather bright green lawn that contrasted that, on which everything happened. And the costumes popped against that very kind of neutral background. I work from the, um, the script and my reactions to it, and, but it's also a lot of, about talking with you. I remember um, Ernest in Love, and the walls ended up being blue images of artifacts or objects from the period, umbrellas and baby carriages and stuff just sort of floating around, sort of Magritte-esque, uh, which kind of surprised me when we arrived at that. By keeping it simple, we allowed ourselves to go a lot of different places. And the color, I kept thinking, is this right? And I was scared when we were putting it up that maybe it was a big mistake, but I think it ended up working. I'm going to ask each of you, since it is a universal problem in our theater for every designer, <laughs> how the hell do you hide the, the column on stage right? I feel like I'm an expert in hiding that <laughs> column. It's It seems like it's all I ever do. Most of my designs start with what can that column be? <laughs> And then I work out from that point. My favorite uses of it are when I can incorporate it into a larger something, a larger wall, so you don't recognize it as a column. I try to incorporate it uh, and amalgamate it into the things that are around it so it's not quite as noticeable. But it's been many things over, over the years. It's been metal columns. It's been, you name it, it's been that. Jim Morgan, what do you do with that column? A hundred things. Well, it's been, been a lot of different things in various shows. And it, as uh, Charlie said, it's, it's often a place to begin. And one of my favorite things I did with it was in Take Me Along. The set was, again, we had to go many places in this little uh, town in Connecticut. And so it was a whimsical take on that town, very hand painted looking, even though it was printed. And uh, that was the first time I had ever used that column as a freestanding building. I remember that it had windows in it. It had windows and a front door and a stoop and all of that. Jim Noon, what, what have you done with it? I think twice I've made it into some kind of tree, which I think is often what most people do with it, or a column. <laughs> and one, one time I just left it there. I just pretended it was. What was, was that show? The home place. We just painted it black and pretended. You just it was painted it black and left it there. That's <laughs> right. That's it right. It didn't really make sense for that play to be anything. So we just pretended it wasn't there. <laughs> and so it wasn't. What would be a show that would give you fun and pleasure to design in that space? What do you think that space lends itself to? What's wonderful about that space is it's always alive in the room. The actors never feel like they're on a stage performing. They always feel like they're in, that everybody's living there, breathing together. And so it, it makes working there, um, creating work there really joyful because it, it, you're, not, you're not looking at a picture, you're looking at an event happening right up next to you. You know, I, I love being an audience member for your other shows. You do, I, I love the work that you do. It's unique, it's, it's uh, particular and no one else does it in New York. Do you have a favorite of, of the ones you've done? I thought London Assur Assurance was a lot of fun. It was, you had such amazing actors in it. It was we a did. joy just to watch them walk on stage every night. Charlie, what's your favorite? Do you have a favorite that you've done there? I have a couple of favorites. The first one would be the Emperor Jones. That was a very unusual piece for us to do. And the way that we were 
able to make it happen and make it accessible to the audience. Tell me how you thought about that. That was a tough one because it does, it, it takes place in a lot of different locations and it mostly takes place in the mind of the main character. So to create sort of a, a, a scenescape that is supposed to be the tormented interior of a person's brain is, was really interesting. And I thought on that one, we really used the space well. The, the walls were sort of this membrane that you could pass through and it was scary. We, we used some of Bob Flanagan's puppets in there. He made us really beautiful skeleton puppets and just amazing props for that. We utilized the turntable in that one. So we saw physical journeys happening as the turntable spun and we saw the sort of descent into madness happen in front of our eyes. That was one of my favorites. The second would be the O'Casey trilogy. And that was just a matter of figuring out how to do three shows simultaneously in rep in that space. The challenge of that was exciting to me. Now tell me you guys in turn, but first you Jim Noon, what, uh, what are you doing in your spare time? Well, I have a really old house. It's 175 years old. And uh, my partner and I, Kevin Adams, have been uh, repainting a lot of the rooms. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so great. So that's fun, because we, we never really get to spend a whole lot of time here. Charlie, what are you doing in your downtime? My sister brought me the other day a very difficult Monet puzzle. And it's been um, very challenging, so we spend a lot of time on that. Uh, but mostly my fiance is six months pregnant now. So keeping her fed really is a full-time <laughs> job. Jim Morgan, what are you doing in your downtime? Well, uh, we're keeping the York going virtually. It's tricky to have an online presence and uh, keep some money coming in so that we can open up again when we need to. Tell me this, what are you reading? I read a lot of newspapers, a lot of the, the Times online every day and then for real on the weekends. And the Daily News, I tend to read the Daily News. Charlie Corcoran, yes. what are you reading? I'm Go stuck ahead. in my mother's house, so I'm reading her books. She loves de detective stories, so I've been reading a lot of detective fiction. Really? Here. And my, my brother is a, he's a former detective for the New York Police Department and is a ghost writer um, on detective novels. So there's a lot of those kinds of things here. Jim Noon, what are you reading? Mostly student stuff. I, well, I tell, us about your, tell us about where you teach and what you teach. Uh, I'm head of the scenic design program at Boston University. So we've still been in session. So most of my days are filled with doing Zoom meetings from eight in the morning till six at night. You're a teacher. What advice do you give about set design uh, if they'd like to be one? To be a set designer, to be anything in the theater, you have to like to tell stories. You have to want to tell stories and you have to want to be involved in the uh, purpose and reason for telling a story. For me, design is the, the, the secondary thing. It's what I do. But I think the most important thing is that you want to be involved in, in finding what people need to hear and figuring out how they need to hear it. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. Charlie, what, what's your advice? I think the best thing you can do is sort of be a student of the world, like pay attention to your surroundings and learn as much as you can and research the things that interest you. I'm always surprised at where um, knowledge I have from some other field or some trip that I've taken has come in handy when designing something. I can recall a specific detail from this or something someone said or you know the way that someone hangs their laundry on a line. Uh, it's, it's just about paying attention to your world and be able to utilize that information to create something new. Oh, Jim Morgan, how do you think about it? I had a very nice education in it, but most of what I learned is when I came up here and worked with various people. The more people I worked with, watched how they did things, learned techniques, working with directors, learning what worked for various directors. It's the hands-on experience that really brought it into focus for me. So be open to experiences and be open to the people you're working with and you'll end up with creating yourself as an artist. Well, set designers are my heroes. You guys are my heroes. You open the minds of, of directors. You open the minds of actors. You, you cause us to explore the possibilities of where we are, 
who we are, why we're there, how did we get there? How can we get out of there? You are my, you are the true heroes of the theater. And I thank you all very much. It means a, a lot to Kieran and me and all our, all our people and all our, all our staff and everything to have you here and to have you in this, in this tough time be available and accessible to us and, and to speak so beautifully. Thank you very much.